Well, I see the Zoom room is filling up. It is noon on Tuesday, which means it's time for the virtual speaker series presented by the Penn State Alumni Association. I want to welcome everybody in to today's edition of the virtual speaker series. We have a great program lined up for you today. Nancy Knaus is with us. She is the state coordinator for the Penn State Extension Master Gardener Program. We look forward to talking to her and about the impact that they are having uh, across 67 counties, 3,500 volunteers involved with the Master Gardener Program at Penn State. We look forward to her presentation and to getting to your questions and answers that have been submitted through the registration form. You can also submit questions on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom video window, or if you are watching on Facebook Live, welcome. And uh, you can submit questions out there as well. We want to know who you are and where you're from. So go ahead and drop that information in the chat box. Let us know where you're zooming in from today. And we will be getting started in just a minute. Thank you for tuning in to the virtual speaker series. Wow, the names are rolling in. I see Julia from Syracuse and Shannon from Pittsburgh, Rachel down in Harrisburg, Jane Hauser in Athens, Ohio, Valerie in Uniontown, Larry in Stafford, Virginia, Rochester, New York represented, Diane McClure up there. Hope you're having a garbage plate for lunch, Diane. Have to get up to Wilmington when we are up to, I'm sorry, we have to get up to Rochester when we are out of quarantine to get a garbage plate with famous Famous cuisine of Rochester, New York. I see Deborah Robbins from Marionsville, Pennsylvania, and Ernie from Paoli, and Kevin Walsh in Willistown, Kristen in Columbus, Ohio, and the backyard of the enemy. Good to see you all zooming in today. What great numbers we have for today's virtual speaker session, which features the Master Gardener program here at Penn State. We'll be getting started in just a minute. Thanks for joining us. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom video window and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat or in the comments on Facebook Live. Speaking of Facebook Live, we are live streaming today's presentation. And this live stream has been brought to you by the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access ideas and audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. Thanks for tuning in today. As a reminder, uh, you can see tonight's Alumni Achievement Awards event at 7 p.m. back here on Facebook. The link to register will be dropped in the Zoom chat and in the Facebook comments. Alumni Achievement Awards recognize the accomplishments of alumni who are 35 years and younger. Uh, it is an inspirational event. And if you are uh, looking to be inspired, join us tonight at seven o'clock for the Alumni Achievement Awards on Facebook Live. Information is in the chat here on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. This afternoon, we welcome Nancy Knaus, the state coordinator for the Penn State Extension Master Gardener Program. Established in 1982, the Master Gardener Program includes approximately 3,500 volunteers who serve in all 67 Pennsylvania counties. Volunteers answer questions on the garden hotline and host horticulture programs, webinars, and demonstrations. Master Gardeners also provide programming for youth and at-risk populations. Since 2012, Nancy has served as the state coordinator for the Penn State Extension Master Gardener Program. Prior to her position as state coordinator, 
She worked as the County Master Gardener Coordinator in Allegheny County. Before joining Extension, Nancy was the Director of Adult Education at Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Pittsburgh. There she managed certificate programs in sustainable horticulture, landscape design, floral design, and botanical arts, as well as overseeing the Phipps Master Garden Program. Thank you for joining us, Nancy, and we will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. One minute and I will get myself set up here. Okay, we should be good to go now. So again, thank you for inviting me to talk about the Master Gardener program. I have been involved with Master Gardeners for about 30 years as both a volunteer and as a coordinator. So I am honored to be the state coordinator for the program in Pennsylvania and work with the Master Gardeners at Penn State. So when did the program actually begin? The program was started in Washington State. There was an extension agent named David Gibby, and he um, was responsible for the horticulture program answering um, consumer hort questions and commercial hort questions. And he was inundated with questions from homeowners. He said that every day he'd come to the office and there would be a stack of questions an inch high that he would have to return calls. And he just thought, you know, I, I can't manage all this, what could I do? So he came up with the idea of offering a training for avid gardeners, and these gardeners would then help him to answer the question. And so he and another um, extension agent started a training class with several hundred volunteers, and this was the beginning of the Master Gardener program. Well, it caught on and now there are master gardener programs in every state in the country, including Washington DC, Canada, and South Korea. The master gardener program is one of the largest volunteer programs in the country with over 100,000 volunteers. In Pennsylvania, the program started in 1982. Clearfield County was the first county to have a master gardener program. And we're happy to announce that this year we now have a master gardener program in every county in Pennsylvania, and there is a county coordinator that manages that program. So some highlights of the master gardener program from this year. After you complete the training as a master gardener, you um, are required to volunteer and give back to your community. The first year you volunteer 50 hours and then in subsequent years, 20 hours. So in spite of the fact that there were restrictions and master gardeners really couldn't meet and interact much with the public, they still vol volunteered um, close to 114,000 hours, which is valued at $3 million. They had contacts with around 88,000 adults and 17,000 youth. And in addition, um, there were many plant sales that were scheduled last year. Those had to be canceled. And the Master Gardeners really rose to the occasion. They ended up donating over 19,000 plants to local food banks and nonprofit organizations in their communities. Then as the season progressed, they donated 17, thousand plus pounds of produce to these same organizations. The success of the Master Gardener program begins with well-trained volunteers. Um, we offer a 20-week intensive training. Um, this training is county-based, so the um, Schedule of the training class really varies somewhat from county to county. There are those counties that offer the training program every year, while others offer the pro program every other year. In the past, um, the training classes were often face-to-face, -face, but um, there were a few virtual training classes. Last year, however, the program went totally virtual. The um, trainees watched the presentations and the the classes from the comfort of their own homes. The classes ran from 6 to 8.15. Um, 
And much to our surprise, people really loved it. Um, they really thought it was great to just come home, relax, watch the presentation. They didn't have to worry about going out in the evening, driving in um, inclement weather. So this is something that we're going to continue, but we're going to create a little bit of a hybrid program because we'll also offer face-to-face um, -face monthly or bi-monthly meetings, depending upon the county, for the trainees to come meet members of their county and their class to do hands-on activities and well as review the subject matter for the particular um, month that they're um, meeting. So um, in addition, just so you know, the training class costs $200 which I think is a great bargain. And it also includes our Master Gardener manual. So as I mentioned, one of the primary objectives of the Master Gardener program is to provide research-based information to home gardeners. So how do we do this? Um, the first thing that we can offer you is you can purchase a copy of the Master Gardener training manual. This is what we use for our training classes. It's a comprehensive guide for a real avid home gardener. Um, the topics range from botany, entomology, plant diseases, learn about tools, um, growing herbaceous perennials, trees, shrubs, native plants, everything you want to know is in this manual. There are 22 chapters. It includes a glossary and index. Um, it's illustrated in full color with over 600 images. And you can purchase the manual through Penn State Publications. Um, we, we will put some of the links that I mentioned in the chat pod, but also after the presentation today, you'll just receive a list of many of the links so you can go back and refer to them if you're interested in any of the um, items that I mentioned. So another way that we answer questions, homeowner questions, is through our garden hotline. In each county, we have specially trained master gardeners that assist in answering home garden questions. Um, these master gardeners are um, receive regular update training. We have um, diagnostic webinars that we provide them the master gardeners on a monthly basis. And these monthly webinars are taught by extension specialists um, and educators that keep the master gardeners up to date on exactly what's happening out there in your garden and what we can expect. Um, last year, in spite of COVID, we answered over 10,000 questions. So um, the county offices for the most part are basically closed. So most of the questions are gonna be answered by email and you can use um, the address that I have listed here, just your county name, whether it's like Allegheny or Berks, whatever, mg at psu.edu. And that will get you in touch with the garden hotline in your county. Now, not all counties, most have a garden hotline, but not all do. But I wanna recommend this other service if you have gardening questions. And this is a national service that's offered by Extension called Ask Extension. Basically plug your question in there and there are teams of people from every state that will help to answer your question. Again, this link will be in the list that is shared at the end of the presentation. Um, when COVID struck, we basically came up with what I think is a really fun way to answer questions. And we call this Garden Hotline Live. Um, it's offered bi-monthly and we, have, we answer pre-submitted questions. So if you have a question you want to submit, you can do that. And then these questions are shared with um, ma master gardeners or master gardener coordinators who prefer prepare basically a presentation that's illustrated um, with the answer to that question. So you really, I think, get a better understanding of the answer to your question. For example, if you're gonna ask for suggestions of particular plants that might grow in shade, they may show you a number of plants that would work in the shady area. So it really helps um, further describe and explain the answer to the question. Um, we also have poll questions because we like to see how much you know before we give you the response. And we include a public service announcement. So what's happening out in the garden that you should know about? Have the 17 year cicadas emerged? Is downy mildew uh, hitting the cucumber crops? Um, has spotted lanternfly 
have the eggs hatched? You know, what can you expect? And that's also helpful to um, homeowners. And really, people have loved this format. So again, you can sign up for Garden Hotline Live if you want to learn a little bit more um, about gardening around your own home. So I mentioned spotted lantern fly. Master gardeners are trained um, to know most of the answers about spot and lantern fly that they can share with homeowners. So if you see spotted lantern fly, we really urge you, um, especially if you're in one of the newer counties where spotted lantern fly has been um, identified, that you can report it online or else you call the number that is listed there on the screen and tell them that you have um, spotted or found uh, dreaded spotted lantern fly. You can also call your county office or email your county office for more information. Penn State also has extension, a great website with loads of information and gives you, provides direction on what you should do and how to handle this pest. One other thing that Master Gardeners provide is a monthly newsletter, Home Garden News. We currently have about 20,000 subscribers and we'd love to have more. Um, and we cover information about specific plants from native plants to trees and shrubs, invasives and weeds, um, pest problems. We have book reviews and we share news about upcoming events. Again, if you're interested, you can sign up to receive a copy of our home garden news. For those of you that want immediate answers to your questions, I, I would suggest our state Facebook group. There are currently over 9,000 members. This book, uh, this uh, state Facebook group actually gives you an opportunity to ask questions and answer some questions. But we do have the group monitored by um, a group of coordinators and master gardeners who make sure that the correct answer always rises to the top because a lot of people weigh in. And I, I found that it's really a great way to learn things as well, because you may think something, you know, you may think you know the answer to something and it looks like something else. And generally you'll see multiple answers for a question, but like I said, the correct answer always comes to the surface. Um, at the beginning of the COVID shutdown, um, the Master Gardener program offered a 10-week series of webinars focused on growing vegetables because we realized that many people would be um, confined to their homes and they may want to grow some vegetables in their garden. Um, this webinar series was really wildly popular. Over 10,000 people viewed the live or recorded sessions. It was free. And it is still free. So if you have an interest in vegetable gardening or want to just brush up on some area of vegetable gardening, I would highly recommend that you pop on and check out this webinar series. It will be available in Spanish as well soon. Another webinar series that we offered during the winter months was the Houseplant Masterclass. Again, there was an increase in people that just interested in growing plants indoors. And this covered the basics and not so basics, everything from propagation to learning all about orchids. Um, there, the instructors included master gardeners, master gardener coordinators, horticulture educators, and even a retired hort professor who's now a master gardener. Um, we did charge for this class. It was $5, which I feel is really reasonable. And it too is still available if you have an interest in learning more about houseplants. Um, each one of these sessions also included a houseplant house call where we addressed an issue that someone might be having with a particular plant and provided an answer for that question. And then at the end of the session, all the instructors um, gathered and answered questions for um, that the public had asked about particular plants. Volunteering is really at the heart of the Extension Master Gardener program and Master Gardeners have connected with their communities with many special programs. One of these programs is called Seed to Supper. Uh, hunger is a growing crisis in every county in Pennsylvania. There are nearly a half a million people who are struggling with hunger and approximately 400,000 of those are children. So that translates to one in nine adults and one in seven children that 
may basically are unsure of when they might or how they might get their next meal. So the master gardeners are stepping up to meet this need by launching the Seed to Supper program. The goals of the Seed to Supper program are to promote health, increase food system resilience, and cultivate community connectivity among adults that are growing on a budget. The Seed to Supper program provides research-based information on vegetable gardening, as well as nutritional information at no cost. So this year we are launching the Seed to Supper program in 13 counties. And next year um, we have another 20 counties that are planning to launch this program. Um, when we uh, set up this program, we actually partner in the community with either a food bank or another community-based hunger relief organization to um, administer the program. We also partner with the food families and health extension team who provide information on food preparation and food nutrition. So um, if you'd like to make a difference in food security, we have actually launched a crowdfunding campaign. Since we offer the Seed to Supper program at no cost, we do need funds to publish um, the course manual that we provide for all the participants of the program. And I'm really thrilled to say our goal was uh, to raise $7,500 for this year. We have exceeded the goal, but you know, if with your contribution, we can publish additional course manuals for future years. So again, you'll receive a link if you're interested in making any donation is appreciated. Another healthy living project for this year is called Growing Healthy Hearts. And the Master Gardeners are partnering, partnering with the Penn State College of Medicine um, with a researcher, her name is Susan Veld here. And uh, the purpose of this is to show that an increased diet of fruits and vegetables will lower the risk of diabetes and cancer. So this next slide, I, I really love because this really tells you um, the value of gardening. It is the third most common physical activity after running and jogging. And for the most part, gardeners eat more fruits and vegetables than non-gardeners. And gardening can decrease depression and anxiety and improve feelings of well-being. I personally felt this during COVID. One of my re special sort of releases was to get out and work in the garden. It really just did make me feel so much better. So maybe many of you can identify with this as well. So this um, project, this research project that we're working on is going to be online. There will be seven sessions focused on um, growing those crops and then three cooking sessions. And then the participants will also have an online discussion board and recipes and handouts for them to refer to. Master gardeners are also involved with um, promoting pollinator friendly landscapes. Um, as most of you know, bee populations are declining. Um, these are being affected by habitat loss, disease and contact with pesticides. Invertebrate populations have declined by 45% since 1974, and 25% of bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. extinction. And so we really wanna do something about this. We encourage um, homeowners to have their, and actually businesses too, to have their gardens certified as pollinator friendly. This program started in 2011, and currently we have 930 963 gardens that are certified as pollinator friendly in 57 counties in Pennsylvania. Other states have also adopted this program, so they've taken ours as a template. So it is expanding beyond the reach of Pennsylvania. So this summer we are going to reach that 1000 mark. Um, the person who certifies their garden at 1000 will receive $75 worth of pollinator plants, as well as a free sign to post in their garden. So there's more information about this um, pollinator program um, in the link that you'll receive. And Master Gardeners also work with youth. Um, we have a poison prevention program that goes to first grade students. Um, this year, we served over 12,000 students in um, 43 counties. The program was completely virtual, and we taught youth 
um, the, imp the importance of pesticide safety and integrated pest management. So it really is a program that um, hits, host hits close to many people. And finally, each year the Master Gardeners design a calendar, which includes monthly themes and garden tips. We selected from over 600 photos that were submitted by Master Gardeners, and there were some amazing photographers in this group. And so I just want to mention that if you're interested in the calendar, it sells out quickly. Look for information about the calendar in our Home Garden newsletter um, next year. And um, Again, thank you for being here today. And I hope that some of you may consider joining the Master Gardener program in the future. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. What a great presentation. As you might imagine, we have a lot of questions that were pre-submitted and some questions coming in here. If you have a question that you wanna be asked, uh, you can drop that in the Q&A tab. We're gonna to try to get to as many as we possibly can here. But first, let's start, um, let's start with some questions about the Master Gardener program and some specifics about when they might be offered across the state. So um, somebody looking for those in the Philadelphia area um, on the requirements and availability for the next time the Master Gardener program will be offered. So the Master Gardener program, um, the training is offered in the fall. It usually be, it begins in October, the first week. Philadelphia will be offering a training class this year. There, um, the applications for the program will be available soon and they will have orientation sessions in May and June. And I just, I just wanna mention also that in some cases, uh, there is an application process and an interview process. There are more applicants than we accept. In other counties, we don't. We need more applicants. So it will depend from county to county whether you um, have to go through the application process. Excellent. And is it the same time of year for all the counties? There's a question here for Washington and Bedford County as well. Yep, it's the same time of year for all counties. Yes. And this one goes even a little bit further in terms of what are the qualifications to be accepted into the program? And then once you complete the program, is there, are there routine me meetings for those master gardeners in the area? Okay, great. Um, so our qualifications are basically a desire to learn and really having the willingness to volunteer. I just want to stress this is a volunteer program. So we give to you this education and we want you then to share your knowledge in your community and volunteer. So we are looking for people that really want to give back to their communities. Um, we continue to offer training on a regular basis. So every month, like I mentioned, there are diagnostic webinars and professional development that we offer to the master gardeners. So you don't just go through the basic training, your education just continues on a regular basis we want to provide you with all the resources that you can, um, that you can possibly have to share with your communities. Excellent. Uh, you touched on this in the presentation, but I think it's worth uh, maybe expanding on a little bit about the challenge that COVID-19 has presented. Um, you mentioned the example of Hotline Live which mm -hmm. I think is a, a great kind of innovation of, of programming. Do you think that'll continue and that you'll continue to offer these kind of webinars uh, after COVID-19? I think all of us have seen that. You know, we, we did have to adapt. And I would say the Master Gardener program, it did adapt. And we found that some of the things that we implemented during COVID will definitely continue, like Garden Hotline Live. That particular um, webinar sells out every month. So we know that there are people that are interested that maybe, you know, weren't able to go to face-to-face -face programs. So this, I think, is just a great opportunity for, for everyone to really get education on all sorts of, of projects and programs. So you'll see face-to-face -face programs as well as continued online classes. So this question wasn't pre-submitted. This is more, you know, my, my interest. Um, when I hear you say uh, about the Gardner hotline, I immediately think the Butterball hotline that we call during, oh, that we call during Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, any funny or unusual 
questions that come into the Gardner hotline that you can that you could share with us? Well, okay, I'll share one that I received one time. I actually thought it was funny. Right. So there is um, a product that you can use on your lawn called Weed and Feed. And somebody asked me the question, what is the surf and turf product that you, you use on your lawn? And I'm like, okay. Um, we've also had questions with people that have, have planted cut Christmas trees and then wondered why they didn't survive. You know, we ask a lot of questions. They, they planted this tree, they got it at Christmas. And we're thinking the tree has got a ball and roots on sure. it. And you're asking questions. And then they're like, well, it didn't have any roots on it. So we, we have had some very funny questions, but, you know, That's, but a lot of valuable questions and we really want to make sure we get the right information out there. Absolutely. Speaking of, of weed and feed, uh, Deborah has a question uh, and wants to know if you can make a few comments about pre-emergence weed control. What, what can you do to kind of preempt uh, weeds from growing in your garden? So there are products that you can use um, now. They should be applied now to prevent weeds from germinating. Um, so that's something that you can do now. There, there is also a product um, that more organic gardeners use that's corn gluten meal. It's also a fertilizer. The thing about using corn gluten meal is you need to use it regularly and have it build up in your lawn. Um, it is a it's a decent fertilizer. You won't get the same weed prevention that you do with some of the synthetic fertilizers, but um, now is a good time to apply those weed preventers. That's great. A couple questions coming in here, um, specific to becoming, uh, how does your garden become a certified pollinator garden? And I think we might even have a link that we can drop into, um, the link for pollinator friendly gardens, but can you talk a little bit about how your garden becomes certified? Yes. Um, so definitely check out that link. And there's basically a few things that you need to do. And one is you want to provide food that is pollen and nectar sources in, in, in plants for the um, pollinators. You want to provide a water source that can be if you have a stream but you may even just need to put out like a dish or something for pollinators to get water. Um, provide shelter. Leave some old um, trees in your yard that are dead because pollinators will use those as piles of rocks and bare spots. I think that, that we need to look at moving away from picture perfect uh, landscapes because we really need to have things a little bit more natural, maybe leaving up those perennials um, instead of cutting them down in the fall of the year because the insects will also uh, overwinter in the stalks of different perennials. So it's not as neat and tidy as we have expected in the past, but I think it's a healthier landscape. And then of course, um, remove any kind of invasive plants as well as reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides. I know all leading know. towards healthier landscapes, which is so important. And that's right. really what we should all be aiming towards. I know we've talked about um, access to these programs at the extension level. I assume that they are also available here in the State College area. Greg is asking that question. Yes, Center County, the Center County program has lots of opportunities and they have a wonderful pollinator garden. It's called the Snetsinger pollinator garden. So I would tell you to go out and experience that. It's really a uh, pretty phenomenal. So there are people tuned in from all over the country. Uh, sometimes we have uh, audience from all over the world. Uh, what advice do you have? Are there similar programs? I know there's a question here, similar programs in Massachusetts and California, or can they call your hotline and kind of describe the, the area of the country that they're in and get, uh, get that kind of advice. What is your, what is your direction there? Um, so it's interesting that you ask about Massachusetts because every um, Master Gardener program in the country, I think with the exception of Massachusetts, is associated with a land grant university. 
So there is that link there. Massachusetts um, no longer is associated with the university, but they do have a Master Gardener program. Um, you'll have to do a little bit more searching for that. If you wanna email me afterwards, I can connect you with somebody in Massachusetts. So a lot of questions uh, coming in related to some specific plants. So maybe I can just uh, knock some of those out here really quickly. Uh, what is your advice for growing vegetables in woody areas less than two to three hours of direct sun? So my advice, unfortunately, is you can't. Um, you, you're just not going to be basis. able to grow a vegetable garden unless you have at least six hours of sunlight. So sorry. So how about um, plants, uh, any tips on plants like blueberry bushes and kind of what ideal soil composition might be for growing blueberry bushes? Okay. So if you're growing blueberries, it's important to really plan ahead because blueberries require really specific pH. The pH is quite low. It's um, 4.5 to 5. So you really have to prepare ahead of time. I would suggest that you... Um, have a Penn State soil test. That's a great service that the university offers to actually see the pH of your soil. And then you'll have to adjust it. More than likely, you'll have to add um, amendments to lower that pH. You can also add peat moss or well-rotted sawdust to the planting hole and just to actually prepare it for planting. So it's really pre-planting and pre preparation pre-preparation before you actually put the plants in the ground. We have some questions about container gardening. Um, one question is asking, uh, does the Master Gardener program have any focus on container gardening? And then another one is, what vegetables are best suited for container gardening? So yes, we do have, um, we love to promote vegetable gardening, especially, for example, that person that just asked about growing in the shade, one option would be if you have a patio or some place in your um, home residence where you could put a container, you can grow vegetables there. So again, you need the full sun. Um, you want to select plants that are um, compact for growing in containers. And there are lots of varieties of plants that are available. You can grow lettuces and spinach. Um, you could grow tomatoes. There are dwarf or compact patio varieties of tomatoes. I grow eggplant in containers very successfully and peppers. The thing that you need to remember about growing plants in containers is first, always make sure your container has a drainage hole and use a potting mix that is that has a lot of um, water holding capacity so that it stays moist and doesn't dry out too quickly because with that limited amount of soil, the container will dry out and you'll have to water it on a regular basis. You also need to fertilize it on a regular basis because again, you have a very limited amount of soil. So continually re, um, supplying the plant with fertilizer, whether it is a slow release, organic or synthetic fertilizer, they're heavy feeders. And it's fun, it's very rewarding. Uh, so some folks are interested in, in weed control. Um, Lou's asking a question as well as Kathleen, and then we had one pre-submitted. So let me try to bring all three of those together. Um, they're looking to kind of control tenacious weeds and ferns like thistle. Um, uh, they've tried uh, to kill with vinegar. This was unsuccessful. So they're thinking about using lawn troll. Will that make the beds toxic? Um, and then Lou and Kathleen are really looking for like natural weed killer, something that um, can be naturally applied and doesn't make uh, use chemicals or make the, the soil toxic. So I don't know if I'm asking that question the right way, but uh, anything you could say about natural weed control? Sure. So um, the first thing that I have to say is that hand weeding is probably the number one choice. You know, it, it takes more time, but just sort of get yourself in the zone and go for it. You've got to be consistent and pull those weeds. Now, um, thistle is basically one of the most difficult weeds to control. 
I would try to hand weed it. You've got to make sure that you get those underground roots eliminated. So, you know, you'll have to dig down, you'll, they spread by these underground rhizomes. So work at, work at removing all those, but you may have to resort to using a chemical. Um, I would not use the Lontrol. I think that's too toxic for a homeowner. I would probably go with Roundup and I would target the weeds. So one thing you can do is you can put on a, like a nitrile glove and then over that add a cotton glove. And then you would mix up your, um, your um, herbicide. And then basically you're gonna take your hands and just target and brush those leaves so that you're not just spreading the chemical everywhere. So that's one thing that I would recommend um, for thistle. Other weeds, I do just recommend hand pulling. The other thing that I, that I would strongly encourage you to do is the more plants you plant, the more competition you give those weeds. So I try to fill up my garden with plants so that they outcompete the weeds and I have less to pull. You can also use mulch um, in the winter time or in the fall, I shred leaves and prep my garden in the fall so that the beds are covered and I have less issues with weed emergence. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is avoid rototilling or turning your soil over because you're bringing all those weeds to the surface. So just let the, the ground lie, cover it with a natural mulch, and that helps prevent some of those weeds. And then get out there and hand pull. Excellent. I hope that helps. It does help. That's, that's always the tough answer, right? Because it's, it's, it's hard work. Uh, it is getting hard down, work. Um, getting down into the into the garden and hand pulling those those weeds. Um, I know accessibility is, is is something that you all are concerned about. Both making the program accessible to all populations of Pennsylvanians, as well as uh, people with varying physical abilities. A question here: Can a person with a handicap, like a knee replacement, who can't kneel still be a candidate for a master gardener? Absolutely. There are many options as far as volunteer um, opportunities. So you could answer the garden hotline. Basically, you can do it from your home or in the county offices. We have master gardeners that write articles for our newsletters um, or local papers. So there are you can give presentations. There are many options for you to do, for you to work and volunteer with a physical handicap. So we've, we've, we've addressed um, fertilizer, we've addressed weed control, um, but there are other pests that gardeners have to deal with, right? There's, there's beetles, there is deer control. Uh, anything for um, recommendations for deer control and maybe how to control beetles within your, within your garden? Okay, so I personally have major deer issues in my garden. Right. Uh, and what I'll say to begin with is that I select plants that I know are a little bit more deer resistant because there's nothing as discouraging as investing money in a plant, let's say a rhododendron or a hosta, whatever it might be, planting it in the garden, you have a beautiful bed and a day later it's gone. So I think it starts with plant selection and choosing plants that are a little bit more resistant. The other thing um, that I will do is I do spray the garden with, there's, there are a number of deer repellents that you can do, use, but you have to sp spray them on a regular basis, beginning right when the season starts. So, you know, selecting the right plants and then just using these deer repellents does help. Uh, some other questions coming in here. Um, really, I would put these in the category of, of pruning. Uh, what are your best tips about pruning that the general population doesn't know or typically do? And then really one specific one about Russian sage plant and how much of old growth should be cut back on an annual basis? Okay, um, pruning, it, it's interesting because I, I teach some pruning classes and it's, I think it's sort of funny that I have more couples that come to my pruning classes because they end up arguing about how to prune. So they come and I'm the person that's gonna give them the answer and, and solve the dispute. So there are lots of people that have issues and questions about pruning. Um, pruning is really an art and a science. 
And I firmly believe when you prune that you should, that the landscape should look as natural as possible. When I'm finished pruning, I want the landscape to look like I haven't been there and pruned, but I may have taken out two, you know, huge wheelbarrow loads full of clippings. So try to keep your um, pruning as natural as possible. Um, remove the dead wood, the damaged wood, and the diseased wood. That's always easy to do. And when you look at the tree or the shrub, whatever you're pruning, walk around it. Look you know, all the way around the plant. Don't just stand at one side and prune from one side. You wanna make sure that you remove uh, growth from all parts of the plant. And know that when you prune, you're basically encouraging new growth. So you can direct where you want that growth to be. Each plant has, each stem or branch has a bud on it and you prune above that bud and try to direct the growth to um, a direction that you really want it to go. And then the other thing that I would recommend is it's, you can read a lot about pruning, but it's actually seeing somebody prune and getting out there and experiencing it that makes the difference. So I would take a class, um, watch a demonstration, get out there and actually try out pruning. And it's something that you'll learn over a period of time. I think it's really hard to, to get it all just from reading a book. It, it's so funny that you say that couples come and seek your advice. Alan Shafranik has just put in the comment that you're saving marriages through pruning and, and thank you for all of that. I know I have been forbidden to use the hedge clippers uh, at home uh, mm -hmm. on, on, on really anything. I'm, I'm not allowed to use those anymore and I've been forbidden to get a chainsaw. So um, clearly yeah. I have not been pruning the right way either. I think a lot of people uh, tend to over prune and they, they're just anxious to get in there and start cutting and they don't know when to stop. It's like, oops, stop. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, a couple other questions I want to get to uh, here. I know we are we are short on time, um, and I want to give you the opportunity, to, again, to redirect people. A lot of these questions can be answered on the hotline, or, or you're available to answer some of these questions that we might not get to. Um, specific qu question about the purchase of spice bush. Um, they're wondering if they need to purchase a male and female bush, uh, and, and, and maybe even and more in general, are there specific species of, of plants that you would, uh, put in your garden that need the male and female variety to thrive? Um, so spice bush, you don't really have to worry about purchasing a male and female. It's a wonderful, um, native plant. It does well in shade. So if you've got a really shady area, a uh, spice bush is a a wonderful option. It also um, is a larval food source for the spice bush butterfly. So you can attract pollinators to your garden as well. Um, there are some plants. So to get back to the question about male and females, right. there are certain plants that you do need male and female. And the most common example would be holly. Another really great um, bush that you can use or shrub that you can use in your yard is the winterberry holly. It's the, the plant that you see in December. Its branches are bare, but is covered with red fruit or yellow fruit. It's really spectacular. You can um, go to garden centers and spend a bundle on bunches of winterberry holly, or you can purchase it yourself. The females actually produce the fruit, the males don't. Um, and when I worked at Phipps, they have a planting of about 800 female winterberry hollies in front of the conservatory. They needed eight males to pollinate all those females. So just make sure that when you go to the garden center <clears throat> that you select varieties that will flower at the same time, you need the male and the female. So it's something that I would go to a good garden center, do some research on and know what plants you should you want to purchase so that they flower at the same time and pollinate each other so that you will get that fruit. Excellent. A uh, question about what would be the best way for an elementary school to incorporate a student school garden into their curriculum with the local master gardeners clubs help? Okay. So we do have a number of county programs that partner with uh, schools in their areas. So what I would suggest is that somebody from the school contact the Master Gardener program in that county. Um, the Master Gardeners will provide guidance 
and direction as to what to plant. They'll help to teach the children. What the Master Gardener program doesn't do is they won't go in and do all the maintenance on the garden. They'll guide you, they'll work alongside the students and the, the instructors, but you know, they, we, everyone would want us to um, work in their garden and weed their beds, but that's ne- really not the focus of the group. We provide education right. and training to help you manage your own garden. Excellent. A uh, couple quick questions here. I think we can knock out. Do milky spores work? Yeah, milky spore works. Let me just explain. So if you have a lot of Japanese beetles, Japanese beetles come from um, a grub that lives in your lawn. So what you need to do is you need to control the grubs and then you'll have less of a Japanese beetle problem. And milky spore is a, um, a natural product that you apply to your lawn and it builds up over a period of time and um, will reduce the population of the grubs and thus the population of Japanese beetles. So it's a more natural way to handle grub issues that you may have in your lawn. And I would highly recommend it. Lynn is looking for a replacement uh, for grass. She wants to know if white clover is a good choice. It is a good choice. We used to have white clover in our lawns, um, but then over time it was, we started to use many more chemicals and the herbicides took out the white clover. And I think you'll see a movement now to add that clover back into turf. So I would, I would recommend go for it. You mentioned the master gardener class, I believe has a fee of $200. Is the manual included in that fee? I think there was a $75 manual. Is that included in the 200? It is included in that fee. Yes. Excellent. Um, Let's see here. June is wondering, okay, so June lives out of state. She's wondering if the soil test is available to um, residents outside of Pennsylvania. It is. I know I just had my sister who lives in California send a sample in. Um, you can just go online and with a uh, soil analytic lab, I believe it is the Penn State analytic lab, and you can send your soil test there. The cost is about $9. It is worth every penny that you spend. Um, I think a lot of times people don't realize how important that soil test is, but you, you don't know the pH of your soil or what nutrients are there until you have a soil test. So I think the beginning of every good garden starts with a soil test. And that's a question that came in from somebody else beforehand too. They want to amend the garden matter, which is heavy, heavy clay, right? You'd probably recommend send your garden matter and like send your clay in right. um, to do the soil test and they will tell them how to amend that uh, right. probably. Yeah, as a, as I want to. I'll add a little bit more to that. So you're going to send in your soil test and then it's important to add soil amendments, but um, some of the soil amendments, we have an issue now with invasive jumping worms and they can be brought in, in uh, mulch or compost that you tend to bring in bulk into your, into your property. And it's something that you don't want to have to deal with because they really feed on a lot of that organic layer in your, in your garden. So make sure that if you are um, adding and you do want to add compost and you do want to add mulch to your yard, make sure that you purchase it from a reputable supplier that he treats that mulch or compost to an appropriate level so that any of those um, eggs or cocoons or weed seeds are uh, not there, that the product, you're not going to be bringing in invasive weeds or invasive worms into your garden, because that is really something you don't want to have to deal with. So that makes this comment then a little more understandable for me. Um, They're mentioning that they found a guy who makes worm tea. Um, Since it's natural and easily transportable, they're wondering about trying that this year. Is that a good idea? Um, I would say that it's not research-based. And so I probably, I mean, I wouldn't do it myself. Excellent. Well, we are wrapping up here. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you go ahead and give, uh, again, how people can get in touch with you? Um, Is there a Facebook group that you can point them to and a little bit uh, more information about how they can connect with the services that you provide? 
So we will be sending you a list of a lot of links and contacts. My email will also be on that list. If you have any specific questions about the Master Gardener program, I'd be happy to answer them. And um, I hope again that maybe some of you will either make sure you use our service, use the Master Gardeners or join our group. We'd love to have you with us. Excellent, thank you, Nancy. And thank you all of you for joining us today here on the virtual speaker series. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional sessions in the coming weeks and months. And this programming is in addition to a wide array of networking events and career programs that are available throughout the year. You can view a full listing on our website at alumni.psu.edu. Thanks again, and we are... Penn State! <laughs>